Good morning, Word of Life Church and our newfound friends on YouTube. Uh, as usual, we welcome you to like and subscribe to our channel, and we seem to be increasing each week. And so, yes, it's kind of encouraging to see that as we move forward. So this is a number of uh, weeks now that we've sort of been in quarantine. Uh, my hair is still, it's kind of okay. We're not going to do a bowl cut anytime soon. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I'm excited to be here today and uh, just get into the Word and talk about some good things. This weather sure could turn around. It's been a bit uh, damp and dreary, but I look forward to an exciting spring. As I look out my window here, I can see some of our trees are starting to form their buds and soon there'll be some uh, beautiful, uh, we've got some nice lilac bushes here on the farm and, and uh, they always throw such beautiful flowers and, and uh, a wonderful fragrance. So spring is in the air, be encouraged and uh, we are going to get there. So praise the Lord. Um, Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5, I talked about that a little bit last week and uh, I want to just sort of touch on that just for a few moments and, uh, and, and just talk about how trusting God is one of the ways to see yourself through in this time of, of uh, struggle, or we call it trouble. And you know, the Bible says that the Lord is a very present help in our time of trouble. God is not distant. We've talked about uh, whether you're, you know, we talked about going to the other side, uh, like Peter, when he appeared to be sinking or drowning, he called out, reached out to God, and he was right there. And I think that is really important when you start to look at what God is doing in your life today is that if you are living the life of Proverbs 3, 5, I'll never forget, I was in, uh, it's weird, I guess I'm showing my age, but uh, back in uh, 1989, uh, I was in Dallas, Texas in college and I was... Um, really struggling just with, uh, I was homesick, I was a baby then, I mean, I was, I don't know, I can't do the math now, but um, I wasn't very old, I was about 18, maybe even 17, but I think 18, uh, and away from home, living there, uh, my now wife Sandra was living here at home, uh, probably terrorizing my parents, but uh, I was in college and really homesick, and in a time of prayer and just really wondering what to do, I'll never forget, in the middle of the night, I, I believe I got woke up, and uh, in, in my heart was the, the scripture, Proverbs 3, 5. And I've never forgot that. And I'll never forget going down the dorm corridor. It was in the middle of the night. It was very quiet. And I thought, I'm just going to go and look at that scripture and just really begin to meditate on that and see what it means for me. And I've never forgot that day. And so I really believe that God was um, bringing things to my remembrance. And I think that's probably one of the most important things to take away from this little sermon that we're going to do today is that. God brings things to your remembrance in your life, past victories, areas where your life, you know, God has saw you through, maybe some of the most troubling times and you wondered which end was up, but suddenly you saw that there was a light at the end of the tunnel and God brought you through. And so um, I think those are things to really begin to look at because the word says that when we wait on the Lord, his strength and favor will be ours. That when we focus on what God's word says and have that come out of our, our mouth, the fruit of your lips will bring him praise because we become a product of what we think about. Um, I've really been trying to watch what I eat. And uh, I'll tell you what, I don't always do well with self-control. And so we've got a new bakery in town that makes these most incredible custard tarts. And so they got dropped off as a, as a, a thank you to, to frontline workers. And I'll tell you what, it wasn't like 13 seconds and I had downed two of them. And so I went away kind of feeling shameful because I've been trying to lose weight, but that was my slip. But then I had to remember that, you know what, we're going to celebrate past victories and God always gives you a do-over. You got to remember that, that there, there's all, you know, the Bible says that his mercy is new every single morning brand new mercy every single morning. So it's not about what you deserve. It's about what God has done for you. And we know that based on Easter and we talked about the cross, that that's what he sent his only son so that we could ha actually have life and life in abundance. And so when we talk about that, we're talking about God's provision and especially in times of trouble. Um, in times of trouble, it, it's really interesting. 
sometimes uh, my wife likes to reorganize our house. And so in the middle of the night, you know, you're, you're trying to make your way to the bathroom and you're trying to get there without waking everybody up. You, so you go down the hallway or down the stairs or wherever you're going and you think you know where all the furniture is. But suddenly something's moved and there's a couch in the way. Or uh, I remember knocking over an old milk, milk can in the middle of the night and I swore it woke up literally in the neighborhood because I didn't know it was there. The only way of knowing what obstacles are in the way is to shine a light on that and to turn a light switch on and focus on where I need to go. And that's what brings us to Proverbs 3. It says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding and in all of your ways when you acknowledge him. He will direct your path. You know, there's also scripture that says that his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path. I talked about that, that train light. There's a, an interesting, I remember years ago watching the train. There used to be a train that went through the back of our farm. And that light, that high beam light was so focused down the tracks. It didn't even seem to light up around the train. It, it lit up literally miles down the tracks. And so... You've got to remember that God's word is lighting up for your life miles down your track. So when he says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart, that really comes to, you know, if, if we've been hearing these sermons or sort of looking at what God has for us, if we haven't begun to put God first, if we depend on logic, if we depend on what your head is saying and not what your heart is saying, it really isn't going to take you down the proper path. You know, when God said that, trust in the Lord with all of your heart, lean not to your own understanding. For in all of your ways, when you acknowledge him, he will direct your path. So I think in acknowledging him was, first of all, when I felt that that scripture was for me in my life, was to acknowledge that God was God in my life and I'm not. That's probably one of the greatest things. And I took a long time to learn that because I'm a fixer. I try and figure things out, try and mend every problem, mend every circumstance. I mean, uh, my good friend Joe would, would tell me, and it was, it was so true. He said, Carl, you don't have to like everybody, but you want everybody to like you. And that sounds really, whatever, simple. But if you think about that, there's a lot in that. And I really recognized that in my life, I, I tend to try and fix everything. And what that does is it takes away my dependence on God. And so he said to trust God with all of your heart. Don't lean to your own ways, but in all of your ways, when you acknowledge him, he'll direct your path. So how do you do that when you're like that train light going down the tracks? You see where you want to be. With this virus and things that are going on, we see where we want to be. It's important that we focus on, you know, the good days that are ahead. I'm already thinking, believe me, I've already planned Christmas dinner. We love to go to a cabin and just enjoy Christmas dinner as a family. I've planned every aspect about that because I'm looking forward to Christmas. I, I, I'm praying that things will be different by then. But in doing that, there's a preparation. There's a thought. There's thinking how we'll do it, what we'll do, what we'll even eat, how I'll cook it, all of those things. So bring that back to your life today. When you focus on God and the things that he's going to do in your life, sometimes we can focus on, but I haven't saw it yet. Well, the key here in acknowledging him in all of your ways is to, first of all, remember the good things. Remember the little blessings that God has brought you every day, because that really is life sustaining. It's kind of like your morning cup of coffee. You know, the word says that with our mouth, we'll give him praise and we give him thanks. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. That's a scripture. And so what does that mean? Well, Thanksgiving means, Lord, I thank you that you, you saved my butt yesterday and you looked after me a month ago and you sent people in my life three years ago and you helped me, you gave me a word in season when I had that coffee with that friend. I know what they said to me. They were speaking right to me. And so when you begin to thank God for those things in your life that have brought you to where you are today, you use those as, if you would, a stepping stone toward the future. So you're focused. Now remember, I'm still trying to navigate through the house, trying to find the bathroom. But if I don't turn the light on, I'm going to stumble. If you don't turn the light of God's word on in your life, finding out what God's word says for you, finding out what his promises are, you're going to just stumble through life and hope that you get there. But you don't want to live life like that. You don't want to just stumble and hope. That doesn't get us anywhere. So speaking of that, I want us to go to Jeremiah 29 verse 11. 
And we're going to see what God says about stumbling and hoping. Verse 29, or chapter 29, Jeremiah, verse 11, it says, For I know the plans that I have for you, saith the Lord, plans for peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. A future. So you've got to, before we read the rest, but God has given you a future and a hope. Gideon at one point in his life was feeling so sorry for himself. He, he lay down under a tree and I think he wanted to just die. And finally, God kind of kicked him in the butt and said, you are a great man. You are, God is going to do something special in your life. And God is saying this to you today. Maybe you feel hopeless. Maybe you feel like you can't move forward. But you know what? You have come this far. There's a lot of people around you that have maybe given up on the race. But it says here, for I know the plans that I have for you, plans for peace and not of evil. Peace and, and, and comfort, if you would. You know, it's hard to say comfort in this time. But peace is something that is available to you today. I talked about that last week. Let the peace of God be your umpire. That down on the inside, you get a knowing that God is going to work everything out. You, got, you, you have a knowing. That I think of that train going down the tracks. It's staying on the tracks. It's getting to its destination. If you go to the GO train, my, life, my wife is a um, big-time Blue Jay fan, and so I'll sit on the GO train with her, and, and I love it. I, I love to watch her have a good time at the ball games. And um, I, I, to be honest, look forward to the hot dog. And so, but as I get on that train, I can rest for a good hour knowing it's going to get to its destination. So in your life, there's a rest that is available to you. So it says he wants to give you a future and a hope. He wants to take care of you. He says, you'll call on me and you'll come and pray and I will listen to you. You'll seek me and find me. And when you search for me with all of your heart, I will be found by you. I want to stop at the I will be found by you. Somehow we think that God is some mystical thing in the, in the sweet by and by that never ever can get talked to or communicated with or believed or trusted. You know, Jesus said he was in all points tested. He was all points tried, but he was also touched by our infirmities. So he knows how you're feeling. He knows what you're thinking. And so it says here, when you begin to call on him, you know, we, we talk about how do you get saved? How do you get born again? The Bible says, call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. So the onus is kind of on you to do the calling, but God's done the answering and God will always answer. And so seek me uh, and, and you will find. He's not hiding. He is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. So God didn't like put these scriptures in the Bible to make like a thicker book. He didn't put them in there when he said to have faith in God. He didn't say that to somehow add more to the chapter. You know, um, I remember when I was in college, and I could admit this, uh, but you sometimes had to hand in a, 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 a paper. And that paper might have to be 3,000 words, 5,000 words, 800 words. And I can remember getting down to about 2,500, 632 words going, I'm all out of steam. I don't have anything else to add to this. And so then you kind of find stuff to add, you know, we call that fluff. You sort of get the words in there and you make longer sentences. And before long, your computer says you're at 3,000 words. You end your paper, you do your bibliography, you do all of those things. You cite all of the things that you, you know, you need to cite and you send it away. God didn't do that. He didn't put all these words in here to make a bigger book. He put these words in here because they're to be used every single day. So we know that when, when, when God says that, you know, seek me and find me, search for me with all of your heart, notice he also said that he would answer and he would encourage and he would lift you up. Go with me, if you would, if you're, if you're following along with your Bible to the book of Judges. And we're going to go to the book of Judges and just see where God has done something supernatural in a great army that had a call and had a plan. But there was some that he kind of had to get away from. And, and so we're going to look at that. So Judges chapter 7, uh, verse 2. And it said, The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many people with you, for, for you have too many people, sorry, with you, for me to give the Midianites into your hand, lest Israel glorify themselves and say, we did this on our own power and we saved us. I got to tell you, in today's society, there's going to be a thousand other things to pull your focus away from God. I'll admit, 
A smartphone is a struggle for me. It's easy to get up. You know, I get up early and I look forward to that coffee. And boy, you want to check Facebook and you want to check emails and you want to check all these things. But remember, that train going down the tracks, that light is focused on the destination. And so I'll admit that's a real struggle for me. But sometimes I have to shut it off or hide it and say, you know what, I'm going to get quiet with God. I'm going to find out what God is saying to me today. I'm going to sit up and listen to him. I'm going to read his word and I'm going to put him first. Putting him first, you know, sometimes it's almost like you need a, a, um, a struggle in life to suddenly wake you up. It's kind of like you driving down the road and you see a radar trap or the police pull behind you. There is nothing, you don't become a worse driver until a, a police officer is following right behind you. Okay, he's following you, and so you're tight, you're tense, you're trying to make sure you know you're going to do 81 kilometers an hour, you're not going to look anywhere else, you're not even going to drink your coffee because you don't want to get pulled over. But there was a circumstance that sort of jarred you out of your, you know, uh, not sleeping while you're driving, but maybe you're, you've been uh, speeding or, or doing something that you shouldn't have. We need to take that same thought when we have circumstances that come our way that we don't understand or we don't like, sickness, disease, pestilence, such as we're going with right now. I know that God is taking care of those things, but sometimes in those circumstances, it can do you good to sit up, take note, and do better. So we're going to see here in Judges, it says, you have too many people with, uh, with you for me to give the Midianites into your hand, lest Israel glorify themselves over me, saying it's for their own power. And so he said, call out the people now. And they said, whoever is afraid or anxious, you can leave. And so Gideon asked them. And so 22,000 people left. We're going to see in a minute here in Samuel. But notice that 22,000 people left and they left a bunch of people here. Watch this. So 22,000 people turned back and 10,000 were left. That's a lot of people gone and a lot of people still there but more left than stayed. Sometimes in your life, you are gonna be alone. You might be feeling like the last man standing. You might feel like the person that everyone else went and did their thing. They're focused on all of the other things in life. But this circumstance in your life has maybe jarred you a little bit for you to say, seek the Lord, turn your eyes on him. Thank him that even through this struggle, even through this time, that God will carry you. Remember my most favorite scripture, that God will carry and sustain you, found in Isaiah. So 10,000 people were left, but the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many people. Do you know that? God, that shows me that God really, really, really wants you to depend on him. He wants you to depend on him to take care of things. When God says, have the faith of God or faith in God, God wants you to know that everything is going to turn all right everything is going to turn around. And so um, then, then they said, all right, so what do we do? And so he brought the people down to the water and the Lord said to him in verse five, you shall set apart himself, everyone who laps the water with his tongue like a dog. Otherwise, everyone else who kneels to drink, the number of those lapping, putting their hands to their mouth was 300. And the rest of the people that knelt and to drink the water. So he went down from 23,000 left down to 10,000 people, down to 300 people. God is not limited by the amount of people around you. God is not limited to any circumstance around you. God is, because this is, if you think about this, this is the amount of people that are going to move forward with God. So the Lord said to Gideon, with 300 men who lapped to drink, I will save you and give you the Midianites into your hands. 300 people. Now, I love this. Skip down just a little bit more. And it says, Now the Midianites' camp was below him in the valley. And that night the Lord said to him, Get up and go down into the camp, for I have given it into your hands. When you pray concerning sickness, disease, despair, fear, the Bible says that when we are weak, he is strong. So just the thought, but maybe if we're acknowledging God, and in all of our ways we're acknowledging him and he'll direct our path, maybe when you have circumstances that are contrary, maybe it's time that we're not the 20-some 20, the 20 thousand that we're, we're doing it wrong. They were in fear. They weren't in faith. They were kind of doing their own thing. Then we saw they went down to 10,000, and then there was a whole bunch, of, I guess, 9,700 left. They ended up with 300. 
So maybe you're trying to do something in the arm of the flesh. You know, the Bible says, after having done all to stand, put on the whole armor of God, that we may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. The fiery darts that are coming at you right now can be fear, torment, sickness, disease, lack in any area. Maybe you, you say, Pastor, I, I, I have I've been weeks without a paycheck or whatever it is. When you begin to dwell on the arm of the flesh to fix your situation, according to this, and this is what the Bible says, God said, when you are going to have all these people, they're going to say they did it. When things get really whittled down to 300 people, then they're going to declare God did this. And that's something I think is really, really important, down to 300 people. So God wants you to come to the place where you're completely trusting in him. Now, my all-time favorite scripture, and I'll keep you about five more minutes, but in the book of Samuel chapter 30, Samuel chapter 30, and I want to read up verse one, because this is such an, this is probably one of the most encouraging things. So we've went from Proverbs 3, 5 to trusting in the Lord with all of your heart, leaning not unto your own understanding or your own flesh, remembering that light unto your path. You're trying to get to the toilet, like me trying to get through the house. You don't want to stumble and hit the couch or hit the chair, or knock over the milk can. You want to get to your destination. But if you've been like that, there is encouragement there because the Bible says that there, his mercies are brand new every morning. In God, when you put him first, you're, you, know, you may do things wrong, but he's not going to do it wrong. And so when you trust, we used to sing, he's got the whole world in his hands. We, we, we used to sing those songs, and those songs meant something as they stirred your heart, but when you really trust in the Lord with your heart, Chapter 30, it says, When David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day, the Amalekites had raided south as far as Ziglag, and they had struck Ziglag and burned it with fire. They were returning back. He was with his friends. They were, they were returning back from war. They were, uh, you know, they, they, were, they were coming to see their family, to celebrate, just like me thinking about Christmas. They were probably thinking about how to make the next prime rib or, or whatever they, they, they ate back then. But, you know, but yeah, they might have. But they were thinking of really good times. You were thinking about summer and then this life happened. And as they were coming, it said they noticed that the Amalekites had raided and they had struck Ziglag and burned it with fire. Can you imagine Ziklag being burned with fire? They're, 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 you know, they're, they're coming into the village. They're seeing afar off. They're seeing smoke. They're seeing it burning. They're seeing, you know, and so fear and terror is going to really begin to creep in. And it said they had taken captive all the women who were there. They didn't kill anyone, but carried them off and they were, went their way. Well, they didn't know that. They didn't get a text. There was no letter. There was no cell phones. So as far as they know, they've lost everything. Their wives, their women, their children, their animals. And David and his men came to the city and they found it was burned. And their wives and their sons and daughters have been taken captive. And David went and he lifted up his voice and they, they wept with his, him and his men. And they wept till they had strength in them to weep no more. So they were pretty distraught. They went from 23,000 people leaving down to 10,000 people, down to 300 people. They didn't have any strength to weep anymore. They were, they were completely undone. And so David needed to find his hope and his trust in God. You say, Pastor Carl, what do I do when I battle fear or doubt or unbelief? Watch this. And so David's two wives were taken, verse 5, and they were taken away. And verse 6, David was greatly distressed for the people talked of stoning him because all of the people were of bitter spirit. For each had their sons and daughters, and they were all gone. Now, I want you to pause for there for just a second. So he's not only distressed, they've been praying, they're weeping till they had no more strength in themselves to pray or to weep. And then it says, and, and this is typical life, is it not? The very people that were around him spoke of stoning him. Isn't that interesting? The very people that you needed to count on to see you help get you to your destination. Maybe it's friends, maybe it's family. Maybe it's people that you thought were your friends, but they, they, they were actually picking up rocks and they spoke of stoning their leader. And so I think of this because he was already distressed. But what was his answer in this distress? 
this dis distression is no sorry in this distressing time what was his answer remember Gideon went down to 300 men because they had to peel off all these people that had all they were distracted by their phones they were distracted by fear if all you're ever going to do is talk fear and the problem you'll never find the solution you've got to begin to do what David so they were already tired they were already spent they had already went before God some of these guys had really began to say, hey, we should just, this is David's fault. Had he not encouraged us to go into battle, had he not encouraged us to go, we wouldn't even be in this, right? Think about your life. Maybe you're a frontline worker. Maybe you've got family members that you're encouraging them to go and be a blessing and help other people. And maybe in this, there's times in your life when you go, you know what, maybe if we had just stayed home and just never left the farm and we never left the house and we had every, everything brought in and maybe there's always seemingly that easy way. But when you stick your neck out to do something, a work for the Lord, again, listening to your heart, not your head. When you do that, there will always be those accusing thoughts. You know, it says in Revelation that the accuser of our brethren, which is the enemy, he accuses you to God day and night. He says, there are no good so buddy, uh, somebody, nobody, sorry, not a somebody. There are no good person here. They didn't do it right there. They didn't do it right there. They didn't do it right there. But those things fall on deaf ears when it comes to God, if you're his child, because the blood of Christ has cleansed you and set you free. And so David was greatly distressed for the people talked of stoning him because all the people were bitter in their spirit. And each one, uh, they were sad over their sons and their daughters. It, this is understandable. But what is the response? Remember, I said way back, I was homesick, Texas, 18 years old, alone. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. And in all of your ways, when you trust him, he will direct your path. Isaiah 43, I believe 17 says, he will sustain you and carry you. Watch this. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Jesus was not the first one to say that. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. You may be the only, if you would, cheerleader on your team. Gideon went down to 300 men from thousands. You may say, Pastor, it's just me and my wife or me and my child or me and my friend or I've got somebody that always we kind of look to the positive. And maybe your flesh feels undone right now. And maybe your flesh feels weak. The Bible says when we are weak, let's say that we are strong. So David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. If you don't know Jesus, if he's never moved into your life, if he's never washed away your sin, you can't start that. But it said he encouraged himself. Jesus said man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. When the enemy was tempting him and testing him and trying him, trying to get him to fail and fall, he came back with God's word. That is the most important lesson you can get out of today is number one, even if you feel like you're alone, you're not because he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Two, he encouraged himself in the most distressing times. He encouraged himself in the Lord his God. So you need to find scriptures all through the New Testament. It says who we are in Christ. There's, I believe, 130 plus scriptures that say, in him we are this, in whom God has done this. Ephesians, I love that book. It talks about what, what you are, who you are in Christ. Because in yourself, remember, God's deal in the Old Testament here was, I can't have 20 some people, 20 some thousand people do this because they're going to say they did it in their strength. God wants to say, I'm God, and because you depended on my strength, therefore you will then have victory. So David encouraged himself in God. He encouraged, so find scriptures that encourage you. Find Psalms and Proverbs, things that lift you up. Things that say that I'm redeemed from the curse of the law. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Think of scriptures that say, when I come before the Lord with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, I thank you that God hears my request. Then he goes on to say that the peace of God that lacks all understanding will guard your heart and your mind through Christ. So when you're going through a troublesome time, today, tomorrow, next week, you remember to say, Lord, you're my strength. You're my peace. You took this battle to the cross. I know I'm having a hard time closing here today, but 
He was bruised for our iniquities. He was touched with our infirmities. Everything that you are going through right now, Jesus has felt and taken care of on the cross. So you could think of it this way. The feelings that you have right now are the same feelings that Jesus was feeling when he overcame those feelings, when he overcame that sickness, when he overcame that doubt, when he overcame that fear, when he overcame that unbelief. And when this is God's word that you have, and when you begin to deposit that word into your life, then you can make a withdrawal. You can't withdraw. It's like your Tim's card. If you load it up with $100, I remember when that, I thought that last me a year. I think it lasted me like three, three weeks, maybe. Not even. I can't withdraw if there's nothing on that card. If you don't put God's word in your heart, if you don't put God first in your life, if you kind of do your own thing, what happens is, you're not trusting in the Lord. And you're kind of like David's guys that said, we're just going to beat up our leader. We're going to blame God. We're going to blame Jesus. We're going to blame the church. We're going to blame this. Playing the blame game doesn't work. Encourage yourself in the word of God. Find the strength in the word of God. And remember, he said, when we are weak, thus he will make us strong. Some of those old time hymns were written and they're beautiful because they went through tremendous battles. But they said, our God is a God that will cause us to overcome. Little sidebar here at the end. Do you know that in this most distressing, troubling time, 72 hours later, David became king? Think about that. He was burned out, tired. He encouraged himself in God. His friends left him. 72 hours later, he became king. And I know I really have preached really a long time. If you need prayer for anything, please reach out, send us a message, text us, do whatever you need to do. Find a way, get a hold of us. We'll get a hold of you if we, if we know who you are. But let's pray right now. And if you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, invite him into your heart. That's the most important decision you can ever make. Vital decision. Lord Jesus, I come to you right now. I believe that you died for me on the cross. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And Lord, right now, I give my life to you. I give all of my circumstances over to you. My troubles, my worry, my fear, I give them to you. And Lord, I definitely am weak right now. But in you, your word says, I become strong. And so right now, I receive Jesus as Lord and Savior of my life. And Lord, I will tell people about you, and I will live for you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Please get a hold of us if you do need prayer. We'd love to pray with you and encourage you. And until next time, and remember, Jesus loves you and he's going to carry you. Amen.